morning, everybody. Thank you for watching the live stream at Life Church. Hey, Life Church, we sure miss you. We're looking forward to seeing you face to face. In just a moment, we're going to be singing some very cool songs to the Lord. But before we do, let's talk to him and welcome him into the celebration this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have today to tell you how great you are through music. We lift up our voices, Lord, because you are great and you're worthy to be praised. So thank you for this opportunity we have to gather over the internet, through television, through computer, through smartphones. God, you're there everywhere at the same time. So thank you for your faithfulness. Take our time this morning, Lord. Use it for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing together. Wait, wait, 
shadows my song of ascent wherever I walk through wherever I am you think move out wherever I stay and if ever I walk through the valley of death I sing through the shadows my soul will say my soul will say of all valleys come the pastures we call grace a mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave I'll praise you on the mountain I I will praise you in the mountains in my way you're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valley all the same no less God within the shadows no, no less faithful when the night leads me astray you're the heaven where my heart in the high in the heart it go to say
in your living rooms, sitting at a desk, lift up your voice and praise your God. Lift up your voice. Worthy are you, God. I pour out my praise to you, Lord. You're worthy, the God of the universe. I praise you for your love. I praise you for your wisdom. I praise you for your principles, your good kingdom ways. I praise you for your promises for my life. I thank you for your love for my life. I trust my, myself to you. I entrust myself to you, God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. He inhabits the praises of his people. He's looking for us to draw near to him, and he wants to draw near to us. Sitting on the edge of his throne, looking to bless his people, empower his people with wisdom, with strength for the day, with vision for the future. We bless your name, Lord. Speak to us now, Lord. Prepare our mind. We're hungry for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everyone. I'm Alexa, and here's what's happening around Life Church. Spring is here, and we have spring cleaning projects to do all around church. If you're looking for a reason to get outside, consider signing up to complete an outdoor project like raking or cleaning the flower beds. Simply contact srburkin at gmail.com to sign up. This week, we started a scripture memory challenge. You can join the challenge by visiting our Facebook page and adding your memory verse. Let's encourage each other and make memorizing scripture a habit. To dive deeper into the Word, we have several virtual Bible studies happening for all ages. Whether you're looking for a middle school, high school, men's or women's group, we have a group here for you. Simply visit lifechurchmh.com groups to sign up. For the younger kids, we have special programming on our Facebook page every Saturday at 9 a.m. for pre-K to kindergartners. And kids up to fifth grade are encouraged to check out Mr. Jesse's lesson at 6 p.m. on Sundays. Life Church is proud to be the home of High Point Christian School Mount Horeb, a 3K through 8th grade private school that provides biblical worldviews and excellent academics. School enrollment is open and the deadline to apply for free tuition has been extended to May 14th. To learn more, visit highpointchristianschool.org. During this season of change, you may be experiencing and dealing with things that you haven't faced before. Our church family is here to support you as best we can. You can make a prayer request for a specific need by visiting our website at lifechurchmh.com prayer, and a request will be sent to a confidential prayer team. Once again, we want to thank you for your continued faithfulness to our church family. You are supporting each other, encouraging your neighbors, and giving faithfully. Your gifts continue to keep our church body strong and allow us to help those in need. Remember, you can mail your tithe or offering directly to church or give online at our website for secure online giving. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, it's a happy Sunday. Good morning, everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see you through the cameras, man. That is so cool. You, and you could see me. That's, that's pretty nifty, isn't it? So we appreciate you watching this morning. It's a Sunday. Sunday, the first day of the week. It's the Lord's Day. We honor Him. Uh, we give Him the first day of the week, and we trust Him to do a, a, a cool thing in each one of our lives the rest of the week. So even through this coronavirus uh, he's guiding and directing our steps. Hey, uh, we want to encourage you to check us out on the church website on the posted video player to pick up the notes for today. Or if you're watching on Facebook, there's a link in the comments section. And um, I've got my notes. In fact, they're all filled out already. That's pretty nifty, huh? And um, we're going to be jumping into the Bible, God's Word, in just a moment. Um, before we do, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to jump into your Word, Lord. We thank you that it's not just words, but they're powerful, they're life-changing, they're transforming, Lord, when we allow them to do their work in each of our lives. And God, right now, we don't want to just talk. 
We don't want these to be just words. But we're trusting you, Lord, to speak through your word, through your spirit. Because you know every person that's watching. You know every detail about their lives. And so we consider it a privilege to be able to open up together and allow you to speak. Now we get it. There's going to be some that um, they've got closed minds and they don't want to hear from you. You give those folks the freedom to make that choice. But God, we thank you that um, as we come before you and we can open up the, do- the doors to our, to our hearts and allow you to walk through the corridors of our lives, Lord, to do something very, very new and unique today. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Chapter 14, starting at verse 22. All right, so do you have your Bibles? You can open them up and here we go. Immediately after this, after what? Well... I'm going to back up to verse 21 to put a little background on it. Jesus um, had just fed 5,000 men in addition to all the women and children. So he just got done feeding a bunch of people. He didn't go to McDonald's or Subway or Culver's, man. He had five Five fish and two loaves, and that's what he worked with. So now we jump here in the 22 immediately after this, after feeding 5,000 men, women, children, probably pushing 15 to 20,000 people. Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land. Uh, You you might be facing some trouble right now. You can identify with these disciples. Oh, yeah. For a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Before we get into the rest of the text, I want to uh, present a life story about a woman named Lenya Heitzik. Lenya was raised by an atheist father, and the moral of the story in her family was God did not and could not exist, and her father believed in the human ability and the power of positive thinking. So that's the way she was raised. But early in her college days, she was weighed down by the baggage of her parents' divorce, an absentee father, and a stoically distant stepfather. And like a lot of college co-eds, she tried to cope with one-night stands, binge drinking, and recreational drugs. But at night, when the lights were turned off, she was left wondering, man, is there something more to life? It's a good question. Maybe you're asking that same question yourself. Is there something more to life, the way you've been living it? And she realized she didn't have the ability in herself to make any life changes. So, during her sophomore year, uh, Lenya's father, guess what? He became a follower of Jesus Christ. <laughs> An atheist. How did that happen? Man, he was out 
to prove that God did not exist and he had a Bible, it was the red letter edition, which simply means every time Jesus spoke, it's in red letters. It's printed in red ink. And so as he was reading it, God began to speak to him and make himself known. And Lenya's father put his faith in Christ. And he told Lenya about it. Yeah, yeah. And she was really threatened by that uh, declaration by her dad. And so outwardly, on the outside, she mocked her dad. But inside, um, those reversal of world views launched her on a quest to really search for meaning in life. And so she took a college class, non-Western religions that included Buddhism, Hinduism, and other religions. She interviewed her classmates about their belief system while they were standing around a keg of beer, of course, and smoking joints. It's a good way to dig deep. But guess what? Guess what? Just like, just like Lenya's father, God came out of quarantine. <laughs> yeah, man, you know what? I don't get it. But God loves you and I so much, he gives you and I the freedom to quarantine God. Can you imagine that? We can can isolate him from our lives. Well, guess what? Guess what? Just like what happened to Lenya's dad was starting to happen to her. God came out of quarantine in her life and started, man, messing around with her. For example, one day she walks by a bookstore and Billy Graham's book, How to Be Born Again, caught her attention. Yeah. Yeah. And so she bought the book, put it in her beach bag, grabbed a six-pack of beer, and drove to the beach with her friends to go party. And while they were there, her friends were in the water, of course, riding the waves. She spread out a blanket, opened up Billy Graham's book, and started reading. She got into chapter 3. Does God really speak to us? And man, that really ticked her off because in the book, you know, Uh, It was talking about God, that he really is alive and that he does talk. And Lenya had been brought up with the scientific belief in evolution, you know, that there was no God. And Graham proposed that God is a creator who speaks through nature, whether it's a, a crying baby or a song of a bird. And so... Lenya's reading the book and she talks out loud to herself and she says, yeah, right, God. Yeah, 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 that's right. And she kind of put God to the challenge right on the beach and she said her first prayer. She said, God, if you rule over nature and if you're sovereign even over the instincts of a bird, then make that bird that's chirping in the distance fly into the tree next to my blanket. Well, guess what happened? That bird fluttered towards her, a small gray swallow, landed on the branch over her head. And so Lenya closed the book superstitiously, man, and she thought, maybe God does exist, and maybe God created me for a purpose. So as she's reading the book again, Billy Graham endorsed the importance of reading the Bible because it contained the very words of God. And so reading it, Lenya was introduced to God's great love, the great love that God had for her and his ability to provide her a purpose for living. Man, when she started reading the Bible, guess what? She couldn't put it down. She couldn't get enough. Because she was reading the Bible, just like her father, she put her faith in Jesus Christ. She said, who would believe that a bird and a Bible would one day lead me to becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah. This morning, you might be an atheist and you're, you're watching, man. You're, you're checking it out. Maybe you're an agnostic, you know. Uh, wherever you're at, maybe you're a lukewarm follower of Christ. Maybe you're on go for God right now. Got all different kinds of people watching. But you want to know something? God loves each one of you. He does. And I want to encourage you, as the title of this morning's talk is Quarantine Fatigue. (laughs) Quarantine Fatigue. Man, how about it? We've been locked down for so long. People are kind of, you know, 
their skin's starting to crawl, like quarantine fatigue, man. I gotta get, I gotta go somewhere. I gotta do something. Well, that's kind of what happened to Peter in the boat, you know. <laughs> he had been in that boat for so long, uh, he got fatigued, and he had to step out of that boat. Listen, listen. Maybe you've quarantined God in your life. Maybe it's time to let him loose like Lenya did, like her dad. Huh? Maybe today's the day. God's pursuing you. He's coming after you. Why? Because he loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. So getting back into Matthew 14, uh, let's, let's, let's uh, nail it down. Jesus was on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Check this, check this uh, picture of the Sea of Galilee right here, man. Isn't that beautiful? That's, that almost makes me want to go there. <laughs> I've been there. I want to go back. Well, look at the mountain ridge behind it. Look at that water, man. It is, it is breathtaking. That's where Jesus is. And um, coming off feeding those 5,000 men and the rest of the people, um, guess what? Because he did that miracle, the people... They started rumbling amongst each other saying, hey, let's make Jesus king. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to make him king because he is so cool because he can, he can multiply the fish and the loaves, man. That was a cool miracle. Jesus knew he wanted nothing to do with that. And so um, he gets his disciples in a boat and he says, guys, I want you to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I'll meet you there later. And then he dismissed the crowds. And the Sea of Galilee, seven and a half miles wide, 17 miles long. Um, man, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful lake. So number one in your notes, it's time to go. Look at verse 22. It's time to go. That doesn't mean you have to leave right now, by the way. But for the disciples, it's time to go. Verse 22, immediately after this, Jesus insist that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. So whose idea was it to get the disciples into the boat? Did the disciples say, hey, we want to get to the other side? No, 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 no. Matthew, when you, when you read this and then you go into um, John uh, chapter 6 that parallels this story, you, you get the idea that this, there was almost like a mob you know, like a mob rule, we're going to make Jesus king. And the disciples, Jesus could see that they were getting caught up in that enthusiasm and in that hype. So that's why he gets them in a boat, boom, get, get them out of there. It's time to go. It's time to go. In other words, it's time to get moving. I don't know where you're at spiritually today, but maybe it's time to get moving spiritually, going after God. We see in John 14, <laughs> John 14, 23 and 24, Jesus says, all who love me will do what I say. Now, let's, let's read that again. All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty easy to understand. If you love Jesus, you're going to obey him. And that's the cool thing about being a follower of Christ. When we recognize how much he loves us, you know, he died for my sins. He paid my sin debt. He loves me completely right now. I'm telling you, there's something on the inside of human beings that respond with, I want to love him back. I want to obey him fully. Yeah. And that's kind of what... You don't see going out here with the disciples, man. They want to stick around and make Jesus king because it's, it's cool. You know, it's exciting. Jesus said, I don't want anything to do with that. So he, he's kind of, the disciples are pushing back. We don't want to go. And that's why it says Jesus insisted. Jesus insisted. He, in other words, he gets those guys and he's, it's kind of like he gets them in a the boat. And then he's the one that pushes the boat out. You guys get out of here, man. Get out of here. Now that word insist, it's a pretty strong word. It means to compel by force. Jesus, as you know, was a carpenter. Strong. Working with wood, materials every day. 
And so he compelled them by force. It's time to get into that boat. It's time to go. And so um, that's exactly what happened. Number two, Jesus quarantined praying for me. Verse 23. So, so we can quarantine Jesus like many of you have quarantined yourself. Jesus quarantines himself. He goes up to the, up to the hillside, the mountain, by himself. He's isolated. He gets away from the crowd, gets away from his disciples, and he's practicing self-distancing. Yeah. We, we get to do that now. But let me give you a little uh, insight. As Jesus practiced self-distancing to be alone with his Father, I think it's, it's a good idea for you and I to get alone with Christ have those times consistently as we read his word and allow him to talk to us. We talk back to him. Yeah, that's how we get through these challenging days, you know, with this coronavirus. That's, that's a good way to do it. And so Jesus, realizing that these people and his disciples were trying to promote him as king, he, uh, he takes off to the, to the mountain and to pray. Now, just a footnote on that. This has been a long day for Jesus. When you look at um, the beginning of, of chapter 14, where we're at, uh, that early in the morning, Jesus found out that John the Baptist, his cousin, had been killed. And he got the news, and we, we read here um, in verse 12 of chapter 14, later John's disciples came for his body and buried it, that's John the Baptist. Then they went and told Jesus what happened. How do you think Jesus responded? Well, verse 13, as soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. Yeah, he wanted to be alone and grieve. That's normal. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, he fed them. So, man, it was a long day. And he was grief-stricken. And he'd done a full day of teaching and healing and feeding. And, um, and there he is. So what do you think Jesus is praying for? What, well, I think we have an idea. In John 17, 11, we're told that this is kind of a, a prayer that was recorded from Jesus. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them. Who's them? The followers of Christ. Them. By the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Verse 15, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. You see that? Keep them safe from the evil one. Why? Because there's an evil one that has a plan to take you out. Yeah, there's a battle. There's a battle for your soul going on right now. Verse 17, make them holy by your truth. Aren't you glad for that? It's the truth. It's not a deception. It's not a lie. It's not a half-truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Verse 18, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. Verse 20, and I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's you and me, man. He's praying for you and me. And we see in Hebrews 7.25 that he lives to intercede. In Romans 8.34, he's interceding for us. And then in Luke 22, verse 31, he's having a conversation with Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. You see, Jesus is praying for Peter because there's a battle raging. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. So, man, Jesus is praying for the disciples that are going to be experiencing some trouble here coming up. Yeah, he's praying for their faith. Yeah. Last week I had a friend from out of town call me 
And we talked about the coronavirus, how it's impacting us, and on and on. And in our conversation, he says, you know, Bob, I'm praying for you every day. Now, let, let, me, let me ask you, how, how would that make you feel? Man, my, my heart smiled, you know. It was like, boom. <laughs> Man, that is so cool. Man, you're praying for me every day. Isn't that cool? When you know somebody's praying for you. Jesus is praying for you every day. How cool is that? Man, he's praying for me. Number three, trouble on the water. Here comes trouble, verse 24. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble. Far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. So they were going across the seven-mile-wide part of the Sea of Galilee. So in other words, they were about three and a half miles out. They got into the boat. Man, it was a beautiful day. A beautiful day, just like today. A beautiful day. But the storm came out of nowhere. And they were in trouble because of strong wind. And they were fighting heavy waves. The storms of life, man. How about it? You might be facing a storm right now. We live in a broken world. There's all kinds of storms hitting the fan, aren't there, right now? All different kinds. And we can either believe, man, the Lord is with me, you know. He's with me. He's not going to abandon me. He's going to see me through. He's going to work in my life through this storm. Or guess what? We can think that God's abandoned us. You know, he's put us in this boat and he's left us all alone to try and make it on our own. Not true. Not true. But we can believe that. So the disciples are making their way across this lake. <laughs> um, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Jesus gets them in the boat. Jesus says goodbye to them. <laughs> why, why are they in this storm? Because Jesus knew that storm was coming. Yeah, that's why he was up praying for them. Man, he wanted his men for their faith to grow and mature. And here, like in the message in verse 24, it says, Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when the wind came up against them, and they were battered by the waves. Man, the disciples were losing a, a, a battle here, man. Um, maybe, you're, maybe you're fighting for your marriage right now. Yeah. Maybe you're fighting discouragement. Maybe you're fighting debt. Um, that can be a sinking feeling, can it? Yeah. Just like these disciples were fighting the storm, you and I experiencing, we experience storms Either we've been in one, we're in one, or we're going to go into one. That's how it is. We live in a broken world. That's how it is. And so there's trouble on the water. And um, the disciples, man, are rowing. They're rowing. And <laughs> uh, what's God doing? What's Jesus doing? You know what? He's got his eyes on his men in the storm. In Matthew 10, 29, what is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. Isn't that cool? Jesus sees when a sparrow falls to the ground. He sees that. How much more does he see you and I? Well, I've got this nifty dollar bill here, by the way, and it's not Monopoly money. It's the real deal. It's authentic. Um, the founding fathers believed in the eye of providence and they esteemed God's providential care so much that they commissioned a Swiss artist to incorporate the all-seeing eye into his design of the great seal of the United States. So every time you pull out a dollar bill, you see that eye? There it is, the all-seeing eye. Every time you, op you pull out a dollar bill, God's eye is on you. <laughs> yeah. His eye is on the sparrow, and his eye is on you. And his eyes were on the disciples. So one thing God can't say is, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah. You might think, man, this took, by, this took God by surprise. No, it didn't. No. No. God's not up in heaven wringing his hands. I didn't see that coming, Jesus. What am I going to do about it? No, no, no. Uh, God sees everything. Nothing catches him by surprise. And he compassionately 
works in each one of our lives if we let them. Number four, Jesus on the water. What happens when there's trouble on the water? Huh? You think Jesus goes the other way? Does he go over the mountain and through the valley to grandmother's house we go? Nope, he doesn't do that. He comes on the water. Number four, Jesus on the water. Verse 25, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on water. The very thing that was troubling the disciples, Jesus is walking on it. When his disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. And in their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. And Jesus, the water walker, covered three and a half miles walking on top of that water. The disciples have been out on that boat for over nine hours. Think about that. The wind and the waves and the rain pounding on them. And they're stuck halfway at the Sea of Galilee. How many of you have seen somebody walking on water before? (laughs) I haven't. I haven't. That's why the disciples freaked out because they had never seen anybody walking on water and they just made the assumption, hey, it's got to be a ghost. They weren't expecting to see Jesus (laughs) coming in the middle of that storm. You know what? Jesus loves to show up in the storms. Yes, he does. He loves to show up in the storms. Why? It's usually in those storms that you and I are more receptive to him. When everything is rosy, everything's going our way, we kind of become self-sufficient, don't we? But man, when the storms come, oh yeah, we call on him. And that's where we're at right now. Here's the cool thing, Psalm 23, 4. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Why? For you are close beside me. Jesus is close beside me. He's not going anywhere. He's right there in the storm. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, put it this way. All God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on his being with them. Man, that's good. They knew God was with them, and they could do exploits for him. So (laughs) we can't miss what Jesus said here. Don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. I am here. Don't be afraid. In other words, stop fearing. Guys, stop fearing because I'm here. And and that same word, I am, was used back in Exodus 3.14. Yeah, I am who I am. Man, he is all-powerful. He controls the wind and the waves, man. He is sovereign. That's what's going on here. Don't worry. I am the God of the universe, and I am in control of this very storm that you're going through. Number five, quarantine fatigue, verse 28. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat And walked on the water toward Jesus, and when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why do you doubt me? Peter had been in that boat long enough, man. He had been in there nine hours at least. And it was quarantine fatigue. He wanted to get out of that boat and be where Jesus was. Friend, if you have quarantined Jesus out of your life, it's time to get out of that boat, man, and get to be where Jesus is because he's right next to you. Yeah, let him impact your life. Peter wanted to be by Jesus. He broke loose. Trina Paulus put it this way, how does one become a butterfly? You must want to fly so much that you're willing to give up being a caterpillar. (laughs) That's Peter. Hey, I could stay here with the rest of the dudes in this boat, man. We could just sit here and watch things happen. Peter wanted, and he was quarantined for taking, I got to get out of here. I got to get to be where Jesus is. He wanted to be that butterfly. That's That's what was driving him. So, that's, that's the way we have it. The boat, the boat, check this boat out. Those of you that have been watching, this boat was here two weeks ago. 
That's the same boat. We brought it back. A boat for Peter to go fishing then, today, two weeks later, guess what? A boat, what is your boat in your life? You see, a boat can be a source of security. It could be something that keeps you away from Jesus. It's your security. What is, what, what's your boat, man? A boat is safe, secure, and comfortable. The water's rough. The waves are high. The wind's strong. There's a storm out there. If I get out of the boat, boom, I can sink. But if you don't get out of the boat, you're guaranteed not to walk on water, friend. What's your boat? It can be that safe place that you've built around your life, and it's taken the place of Jesus. It's time to get out of that boat, that security, and trust Jesus in the midst of that storm. And so, um, man, if we can hibernate in that boat, it leads to stagnation. Man, spiritually, you're, it just, it, it, it's cold to your soul. That's what happens. But Peter, whew, he got out of that boat and went after Jesus. So, guess what? In the midst of that storm, Peter takes his eyes off Jesus, starts to sink, and he says one of the longest prayers recorded in the Bible. Save me, Lord. Pretty long, huh? You know, when you're desperate, sometimes it's just a short, quick prayer. I can tell you something. A lot of my prayers are very simply, Lord, help me. I need your help. And Peter was desperate. And, and, and he cried out to Jesus. And I love this picture. Check this picture out where Jesus reaches out and grabs Peter, man. Isn't that cool? That's where he's walking out there, but he's crashing. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> there he is. It's the hand coming out of the water. Jesus grabs him. Whew, man, Jesus could have said, Peter, you need to... You, you need to backstroke for a while. You know, you took your eyes off of me. You need to stay in this water a little bit while, while longer. No, no, no. Jesus immediately reaches out and grabs him. Talk about love, huh? Yeah. Verse 31, you have so little faith, Jesus said, why do you doubt me? Why do you doubt me, Peter? It's because he took his eyes off of Jesus in the middle of the storm. So, number six. Number six, Jesus keeps his promise. I love this. Verse 32, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God? No kidding, they explained. Jesus keeps his promise. You know, Jesus could have stilled that storm a little earlier. That man, it would have saved the disciples a lot of anguish, anxiety. But Jesus waited to the darkest time of the day the fourth watch of the day. Because the disciples would realize that at the darkest time of the storm, Jesus shows up. Yeah. He was building their faith. And he wanted to teach these guys a lesson. Jesus wants to teach you and I a lesson too because he wants us to become more like him. And um, God's in the middle of our storms and we can rest in that. Verse 33, the disciples worshipped him. Man, when they saw the power of Jesus calming the storm, the only thing they could do is worship. Put on a worship song. Man, like the songs we sang this morning earlier, you know. Sing them to the Lord. Worship him because he's worthy. You really are the son of God. Now, what's the promise? Can we go back to verse 22? Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and what? Here it is, cross to the other side of the lake. It doesn't say go halfway out and come back. It says go to the other side of the lake. And then in John 6, 21 in the parallel, it says then they were eager to let him in the boat and immediately they arrived at their destination. Jesus keeps his promise. I'm telling you, the Bible is loaded with the promises of the Lord that's why it's imperative you read the Bible. Get to become familiar with those promises and you can apply them to your life. So Jesus keeps his promise, man. I am so glad he does. He doesn't lie to me. He doesn't deceive me. You know. 
Man, Lenya, the atheist, God came after her. He kept his promise with her. Great news. Back in 1665, London merchants, this was at the time of the Great Plague in London, decided to escape to Manchester to save themselves. Man, they figured, we're going to get away from from London, we're going to get away from this plague. But what they didn't know was that they carried the plague with them on their clothes. Yeah, the plague arrived in Manchester when they did. Maybe you've been running from God and you've quarantined yourself from God. But by running, you're carrying your sin, the plague of sin, with you. You can't get away from it. And just as Jesus came to the disciples in the middle of the storm, he's come to you this morning. Yes, he has. In Acts 4.12, it says, There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. Yeah, Jesus we've been talking about today. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way. And so your sin, the plague, stands between you and a holy God. What's the reward for sin? It's a death penalty. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. It's separation from a holy God for all eternity. We're running just like those London merchants, but our sin follows after us, doesn't it? That's why we need a Savior. The one who paid for our death penalty in full. He didn't deserve to die for my sin. Not at all. I should have died for my sin. But out of his love, Jesus did all the dying for all the sinning that I have done. Today, everything depends on what you do with Jesus. Will you continue to quarantine him from your life? You have to decide. This morning, it's a great day to make a decision for Christ because Jesus is ready to walk into your life this morning. The same way he walked on that water to the disciples, he's ready to walk into your life. Romans 6, 23, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That free gift of salvation. Have you accepted God's forgiveness? If not, this morning is a great time to do it. Lord, I need your forgiveness. And so I'm going to pray and you can repeat after me, allowing Jesus to be invited into your life because he's there waiting right now. Dear Lord, I acknowledge to you that I am a sinner. Sin will keep me away from a holy God. I believe, Jesus, that you died for my sins and you rose on the third day. By faith, Lord, by faith, I receive that free gift of salvation. And Jesus, as my Savior, I place my trust in you. You promised to save me, Lord, and I believe it because you cannot lie. You cannot deceive me. And so I believe right now that you, Jesus, have become my personal Savior. You have forgiven all my sins by your precious blood. I will live for you, Jesus, the rest of my life by your Spirit's power. So I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed and invited Jesus into your life to become your spiritual leader, man, I celebrate with you. Go to our lifechurchmh.com website. There's ways that you can connect with us, and we would love to give you more information what it means to become a follower of Christ and how you can grow in your faith in that relationship with Jesus. So thanks for watching this morning. God bless you. Have a great day. for you.
There's no 